costume designer William Ware Tice. This is episode 46. You're listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. He worked on Spartacus, Harold and Maude, Pete's Dragon, Butch and Sundance, The Early Days, The Man with One Red Shoe, and of course, Star Trek. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casto. He is costume designer William Ware Tice. And he is responsible for creating some of the most memorable costumes in Hollywood. He certainly created some memorable ones on Star Trek, I'll tell you. Yes, yes, he did. But before we talk about Bill Tice, let's remind listeners how they can reach us. You can do so by going to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash 70s Trek. You can also send us an email uh, to 70s Trek at gmail.com. You can find the show on iTunes as well. Just search 70s Trek in the podcast section. And if you're there, leave us a rating or a review. It'll help others find our show. In 1966, Star Trek was notable for its special effects. The set designs, the design of the ships, the colorful uniforms and costumes as well. That clothing was designed by William Ware Tice. Uh, He had a reputation for being eccentric and perhaps even rude, but he was a perfectionist, relentlessly driving those working under him. And his motto... Uh, first and foremost, was stop when you when all work is done and not before. I think that's a great motto. You know, as we looked at Bill Tice, I was struck by the fact that he was Cary Grant's assistant and helped make him the best dressed man in Hollywood back in yeah. the day. Yeah. Well, why don't we dive in and uh, start talking William Ware Tice? You know, he was born in Medford, Massachusetts, the son of Harold and Helen, and was named for his paternal grandfather, William Hodgson, and his paternal great-grandmother's family, Ellen Ware Hodgson, which is where the Ware comes from. Where did it come from? That's correct. He attended the Art Center College of Design at Stanford University and also did a four-year stint in the U.S. Navy. He also worked for six months when he, when he left the Navy at Review, which later became Universal Studios, as an apprentice artist in the art department. And he then went on to work for CBS in the wardrobe department on uh, two soap operas way back in the day. Way back. Way back. And he was the wardrobe consultant on the 1963 film The Pink Panther. And that was his first as a designer. After The Pink Panther, he went back to TV, worked as a wardrobe designer for shows like Hollywood Palace, My Favorite Martian, and The Farmer's Daughter. And that's when he went to a little show called Star Trek. Yes. In 1964, a friend of his, Dorothy Fontana, introduced Tice to Gene Roddenberry. Uh, And, you know, one thing led to another, and Gene hired him as the costume designer for Star Trek. Now, he was costume designer for Star Trek, through the whole run of um, the original series, including starting with The Cage, the first pilot. Now, as you know, he has some really colorful and unique costume designs, but one of his most iconic is the Starfleet uniform. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's just classic now. I mean, we all look at it and it's we just kind of stumble all over ourselves. So it was just Oh, well, um, you, you know instantly what it is. It, it exactly. is so memorable. It is. So we got in a little bit of a controversy, though, with the female Starfleet uniform, <laughs> with those really short skirts. Uh, now, ironically, it wasn't um, it wasn't Tice that came up with that. Uh, Grace Lee Whitney, who's Yeoman 
uh, Janice Rand, she gave him the suggestion instead of using the the slack she wore in the pre-production publicity shots, Mm -hmm. uh, she suggested the short skirts. It was kind of more in style at that time. Really? I didn't know that, but but you're right. I mean, if you look back at the cage and where no man has gone before, yeah, the ladies are wearing pants. Right. Exactly. I, I'd never thought about that until you just said it. I didn't think about it until I researched it. <laughs> thank you, Yeoman Rand. Yeah, thank you. So outside of the uniform, he was notable for his very unique female costumes. I was wondering and, what, what adjective you were going to use there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was careful. <laughs> this is a family show. There you usually. go. Uh, so if you remember, the female android costume in What Are Little Girls Made Of, it had a revealing top that consisted of only two um, crossing straps of material that connected in one piece to the trouser. It was very revealing. Um, now... Tice's personal favorite is from Who Mourns for Adnaeus. Ah. And if you remember, this is Leslie Parrish's uh, costume. It's backless dress um, in which the front of the dress was held up by the weight of the train. And if you, if you remember, the, the train of the dress kind of sh- went over her shoulders. It's right. kind of unique. There is legend, uh, uh, I've read it in different places, that he actually used two-sided tape in private yeah. places to yeah. to help dresses and coverings stay in place is is did you come upon that as well yeah see and gravity would recommend that he do, does that you know <laughs> <laughs> now, we're, so we're, the, i hope everybody understands we're treading lightly and probably stumbling more than we normally would because it's a s- sensitive subject right now, on, interestingly, not all the guest stars really appreciated Tice's <laughs> approach. So, so from issue seven of Inside Star Trek, uh, they they recall on one occasion, or Tice recalls on one occasion when, and this is a quote: "When I first met Jill Ireland, she was a little uneasy about me, and I didn't find <laughs> out until later it was because she had seen Sherry Jackson's costume." <laughs> Now, this is Sherry Jackson was Andrea from What Are Little Girls Made Of, the android we spoke of. Did she think um, she was going to get the Tice treatment? Yes. She was afraid (laughs) I was going to do as revealing on her. Oh, my. And that's his quote from um, from You you can imagine. Yeah, probably most female guest stars thought that that was coming. Well, right. And you can look through the catalog of what he did. To women's uh, wardrobe on that show, and I think Jill Ireland had some right to fear him. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, now, something I didn't know about Tice is he also designed a vul- the Vulcan Idic symbol in the episode. Is there in truth no beauty? Did you know that? Mm-mm. So just a little thing. He he contributed more than just costumes. Uh-huh. Um, now, Bob had mentioned that, you know, at the beginning that he was a little demanding. He drove his staff pretty hard. Uh, and he and you gave the quote, you stop when all or I did you stop when all work is done and not before. And he also said better rude than late. <laughs> so kind of interesting. Um, in Star Trek, the original series sketchbook. A colleague of his, Andrea Weaver, said this about Tice. Bill Tice was a very creative designer. He designs for Star Trek were original rather than distilled from other sources or redefinition of previous work. This is what I appreciated about Bill Tice. I thought he was truly unique and rare costume creator. Others may have agreed, but were more influenced by Bill's personal eccentricities and rudeness. Oh, rudeness. Yes. Ooh. Let's move beyond the original series. Uh, in 1970s and early 80s, uh, and we're leaving out Star Trek Phase Two, but you'll, we'll get there in a second. Uh, he designed costumes for several TV movies and motion pictures. So some of the TV movies were Genesis Two, 
Do you remember Genesis 2? I do. And Brat Patrol. Now, I never saw Brat Patrol. Uh, he did uh, motion picture movies, Spartacus, Harold and Maude, Pete's Dragon. Now, he was uncredited here, but he was the costume designer. Um, Who Will Stop the Rain, The Man with One Red Shoe. And now, he was uh, nominated for three Academy Awards for movies, but he never won. So the three movies that he was nominated for, though, were 1976's Bound for Glory, 1979's Butch and Sundance, The Early Days, and 1983's Heart Like a Wheel. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I guess I didn't realize he'd been nominated, but that, you know, he does such unique work. And even going back, I'm just going to go back to the regular series, the regular series. I'm just going to go back to the original series here just for a moment and talk about Terry Garr's outfit. Oh, yeah. And I'm it's, it, you know, there's Bill Tice looking at what's happening uh, in the culture at that time. But he still came up with a very unique look that was all his own. And, right. you know, he didn't just go to the store and buy something off the rack for, for Terry Garr. He created something unique that fit what was happening. And, and of all costumes, he could have gone to a rack because it was set in the same time frame the, sh uh, the show was recorded. Easily could have gone to a rack. Yep. And just pulled something off of, uh, you know, Macy's. Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about the 70s some more here and Star Trek Phase 2. You know, when Gene started planning for that series, he wanted to bring Bill Tice back as the costume designer. Um, and Tice began working in July 1977, planning out what the updated costumes would look like, the uniforms. Uh, as a cost-saving measure, he didn't really design new uniforms. He just updated the original, uh, the original look. Um, he did stress that civilian clothing, though, had to be designed from scratch. He wanted those folks that weren't in Starfleet to have sort of a unique look that was that echoed what we would see at that time, but was different. Right. Make and it makes sense. And you can see that in the next generation when we right. meet people that aren't in Starfleet, but they are civilians. They wear a suit, and and the suit echoes what we might have people wearing today. Right. I thought that's, I always thought that was very smart on, on his part. When the project was reworked uh, and it turned into the motion picture, director Bob Wise wanted new uniforms and he brought in a new designer, Robert Fletcher. And uh, so Bill Tice was out. This ended Tice's involvement in Star Trek until... The next generation was being planned in 1987. Roddenberry invited Bill Tice back as costume designer, and he wanted to draw inspiration for these new uniforms and new costumes from the work he did on the original series and also Phase 2. But, hmm, scratch your chin, somehow the uniforms don't really look a lot like what Robert Fletcher did on the motion picture. Meow. Well, hmm. Can you say cat fight? Cat fight. <laughs> <laughs> a little animosity there. Maybe, perhaps. He, perhaps he felt slighted a little bit. If you look at the original uniforms from season one on The Next Generation, they're very utilitarian, and that's the look he was going for. Rather than sort of the um, pajama top that we saw in the original series, he wanted something that was a little bit more space suity, like modern-day astronauts wore right. the one-piece suit. Well, while those were utilitarian, you have to admit, though, he wasn't shy from pulling out the titillating ones either, like right. he did in the original series. Um, you know, one comes to mind, and you tell me if you remember this one, Kelly. Do you remember when Tasha Yar wore that sort of Chris oh. crossing harem girl outfit in the naked oh, now. Yes. Yes. That was um, memorable. I'll use that word. That was memorable. And, and then there's the one which I always think it stands out, not because it's necessarily titillating, but because it just stands out. 
it's when Riker in the episode Angel One is wearing this this top and his whole big hairy chest is hanging out of it. <laughs> Oh, and it's it's funny because they read an interview that Tice did, and he was saying that Jonathan Frakes actually was embarrassed to wear the costume. Oh, was he really? And actually, you know, being the he says the professional that Jonathan was, he actually incorporated that into his character because, as a you know, a Starfleet commander, he was a little uneasy as a Starfleet commander wearing it as well. So it just kind of played naturally. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, as a professional actor and, and as one of the stars of the show, they pull this out. You're going to throw a hissy fit? No. Right. You, you're going to wear it. You suck it up and you move on. Right, right. You know, for the most part, um, I really liked what Tice did in the first season. Although I do have to sort of take exception to the man dresses. I, I, I kind of really had... An issue with the man dresses. Do you remember the man dresses oh, early yes. on in in season one? And they popped up a few more times. But you would see guys walking through the hall, and you'd see girls wearing the exact same outfit as the guys, and it would stop yeah. at at it wasn't even mid thigh; it was higher than mid thigh. So really, they were man mini skirts. <laughs> they were mani skirts. I mean, it, it was again unique though right it was unique it was memorable it was also (laughs) yes i'm looking at it like i would never wear that (laughs) yeah anyway it was all of that and and then some so uh, i while i really appreciate everything bill tice has done i'm not sure the man skirt the manny skirts were were appropriate Anyway, let's move on. So Tice decided not to return at the end of season one, and there was a lot of a lot of chaos going on behind the scenes. And in fact, Shatner produced a documentary, William Shatner did, called Chaos on the Bridge, which really goes into detail about all of the behind the scenes craziness uh, that was happening uh, at Next Generation. A lot of it had to do with Gene Roddenberry's lawyer, Leonard Mazelish, who... Roddenberry used to do a lot of his dirty work or or hard work, I should say. If somebody needed fired or things needed done, he would ask Mazelish to do it. But then Mazelish also began to get involved with production, which he wasn't supposed to do. Was even writing scripts and correcting scripts at one point, which he wasn't supposed to do. Uh, and and in fact, the Writers Guild slapped him. And, oh really? Uh, yes, yeah, so they went to uh, arbitration. Because Leonard Mazelish was in there editing scripts, which he wasn't supposed to do. Right, exactly. So with all of this craziness, uh, D.C. Fontana didn't return. uh, David Gerald didn't return. And I'm sure Bill Tice decided not to return, too. And in fact, you know, a lot of Gene's friends that were with him on the original series were gone when season two started. So let's talk about Next Gen and... and there was a couple Emmy nominations that um, Tice was involved with. So the first one was for his work on The Big Goodbye. And he actually won that Emmy for costume designer in the category Outstanding Costume Design for a series. Uh, and he was the sole winner. Well deserved, too, because those costumes for that show was, I almost said was, were really, really good. Oh, yeah, definitely. And then in 1989, he was nominated again, um, along with uh, the costume designer Dorinda Wood. And that was for uh, Elementary Deer Data. So, But it was a nomination they didn't win. That's not bad, though. I mean, when you think about it, he had two Emmy nominations and one win for one season's worth of work. Right. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's pretty right. impressive. And I, you know, I just read a little bit about the second nomination and it's because his, his costumes carried through right. into the second season and, and beyond. Right. Um, now in 1992, sadly Tice died, uh, complications of AIDS at the age of 61. So, uh, but moving on and people found out the next year in 1993, uh, that Tice had retained ownership of a lot of his creations. Oh, really? Yes. And so a large number of these original series creations 
uh, were sold off as his his estate, quote unquote, um, in the William Ware Tice uh, estate auction. Did he still have those costumes? Yes. Yes. So they didn't stay at at Paramount when he left the original series. They went with him. They well, they were his property. I think they traveled around a little bit. Um, so but, somehow he added in his contract that whatever I create here, I get to keep. Yes. He, wow. He kept. So example, um, lot 810, William Shatner's tunic from several of the uh, Star Trek episodes uh, sold for $18,400. You're talking at this William Ware Tice estate auction after he yeah. died? Yeah. It sold for 18000 Yes. Wow. And – if you, I, there's a list here, we're, we're not going to go through the whole list, but every single one, they, you know, th- these auctions, they estimate the value, right? Um, and every single one practically went higher than what they estimated. Okay, so I'm guessing Shatner's, since he's the star of the show, that had to be one of the highest costumes to be sold. Was that was that right? Yes. yes. What it, did Leslie Parrish's costume <laughs> sell for? Okay, so. Get this. It was estimated to sell for somewhere between seven hundred to nine hundred dollars, and it went for nine thousand two hundred. Really? It, like a factor of ten? Wow. wow, that is amazing. Well, and and I think I think that costume too is probably the best example of his of his work on that it's, show. Don't you? Oh, absolutely. And maybe even uh, Shatner's tunic and, and her dress are probably the best examples of his Star Trek work overall. Right. Well, and definitely the most memorable. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and it's funny that we're going to end with this, too, as we're talking about Leslie Parrish's costume. Y- you know, Bill Tice developed a theory that the attractiveness of clothing on women really had nothing to do with how much skin was being shown. Now, as you look at his creations, you go, oh, come on. There's so much skin. <laughs> right, right. But he, but, but he thought, no, it's not really. It doesn't have anything to do with how much skin is being shown. But instead, what really makes a dress attractive was if it looked like it was about to fall off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I guess he's right. And and later on, this became known as the Tice titillation theory. Next week, we're looking at what I call the gateway drug that <laughs> led many 70s youngsters to Star Trek. Yes, we're talking about lust in space. See you then. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek.